Remember, remember, the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason and plot. I know of no reason why the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Or so the rhyme goes. For us Brits, the 5th of November, or bonfire night as it's commonly known, is a fun time to spend with family and friends, drinking mulled wine around a toasty bonfire, and watching dazzling fireworks explode into a thousand sparkling colours in the night sky. But actually, we forget what this annual celebration stands for. For on this day in 1605, one of Britain's biggest ever terrorist plots was uncovered, when the English Catholic Guy Fawkes was found secreted in a storeroom under the Houses of Parliament, 36 barrels of gunpowder in hand. Today, Guy Fawkes has become synonymous with the gunpowder plot, but of course, he was not acting alone. He was just a small part of a large-scale Catholic conspiracy to blow up an oppressive Protestant king and his government. What caused these Catholics to take such drastic action? And what exactly did the gunpowder plot entail? We're taking a look in this very short introductory video. It's the year 1605, and a Scottish king sits on the throne of England. Being the son of Mary Queen of Scot and the great-grandson of Henry VII of England, he was well-placed as becoming the first monarch to hold the dual crowns of England and Scotland. He is James VI of Scotland and James I of England. The English crown, however, sits heavy on the king's head, for the kingdom has experienced decades of religious intolerance and infighting. The king has a tough decision to make. He wishes to mend relations with Catholic Spain, but being a Protestant king in a Protestant England, he wishes to have all his subjects conform to the state religion. Spain has vowed to protect English Catholics, and James knows that if he continues to suppress his Catholic subjects, he risks compromising any treaty with Spain. The king ponders whether he could impose further sanctions against Catholics and still have his peace with Spain. The current tensions in England can be traced back to the turbulent rule of Henry VIII. The official state religion in England had historically been Catholicism, but following the Protestant Reformation that swept through Europe in the 1530s, Henry took the decision to formally break with Rome. The Act of Supremacy in 1534 formally replaced Catholicism as a state religion with Protestantism. The suppression of Catholics had begun, but when Henry's daughter, Mary Tudor, ascended to the throne in 1553, she repealed the Act of Supremacy the following year and sought to return the country to Catholicism. Mary, however, was brutal. She earned her nickname Bloody Mary by brutally burning thousands of Protestants. Fortunately, her rule was short and she was succeeded by her half-sister Elizabeth I, a Protestant like their father. Once again, the Act of Supremacy was issued and the official state religion returned to Protestantism. Under Queen Elizabeth, the persecution of Catholics worsened. Elizabeth was responsible for passing a series of harsh statutes aimed at forcing Catholics to conform to the Church of England. Catholics who refused to conform were fined, intimidated and imprisoned. Furthermore, foreign priests sent to England to maintain the Catholic faith were at risk of being tortured and even murdered. This led to Catholics having to practice their faith in secret. This anti-Catholic sentiment had been partly fueled by Mary's treatment of Protestants. The fear of foreign invasion, as a Pope sought to reaffirm his influence in England, had also been a factor. Either way, under the rule of Elizabeth, the situation for Catholics worsened, and anyone found to be practicing the Catholic faith were punished. After years of oppression and mistreatment, English Catholics were optimistic when Elizabeth's Scottish cousin, James, acceded to the English throne in 1603. It was hoped he would usher in a period of greater religious tolerance, but after two years on the throne, it was clear that nothing was going to change. James was keen to remedy the situation at home, and although reluctant to pass further laws capable of marginalising Catholics, he continued on the path of his predecessor. The situation for English Catholics was dire. They believed they followed the one true faith, and the relationship between them and the Protestant establishment was at breaking point. Something had to be done. Robert Catsby was an English nobleman who grew up in Warwickshire, the only surviving son of influential Catholics Sir William Catsby and Anne Frockmorton. He inherited his father's vast wealth when he died in 1598. Like his father, Catsby was well known to the Protestant establishment for flouting the law and refusing to conform to the state religion. In fact, a plot against Queen Elizabeth in 1601 involving the Earl of Essex saw Catsby being injured and imprisoned. 
He was lucky to escape prison with his life, but after paying a substantial fine, his freedom was granted. Catsby was desperate to return England to Rome, and like many other prominent Catholics, he saw the only way forward as involving violence. He was a man at his wit's end, and following the huge fines he had been made to pay, also on the verge of financial ruin, Catsby decided to blow up Parliament, and everybody in it. He began meeting in secret with close friends and like-minded English gentlemen. Among these initial conspirators were his cousin Thomas Winter and a fellow nobleman John Wright. Catsby was keen to attract as much support as possible and organised for Winter to travel to Flanders under Spanish control at the time to petition the King of Spain for help. The King, however, while sympathetic to the plight of English Catholics, was so preoccupied with securing a peace treaty with England that he refused to offer any assistance. The trip was not entirely without its merits, however, as Catsby was able to recruit the assistance of English patriot and experienced soldier Guido Fawkes. Fawkes was a veteran of the Eighty Years' War, having fought on the side of Spain against Dutch Protestant reformers in the Low Countries. He had a particular skill set, including an expert knowledge of explosives. Fox was a devout Catholic and hated everything Scottish. On the 20th of May 1604, Catsby met with Wintour, Wright, Fawkes and new recruit Thomas Percy at a pub in London. Percy was an employee and distant relative of the Earl of Northumberland and subsequently well connected. During this meeting, Catsby formally unveiled his plan to blow up the King and Parliament. He had chosen the state opening of Parliament to execute this plan as not only would the king and his wife be present, but also key ministers, nobles and high-ranking members of the Church of England. It was the perfect opportunity to cause maximum disruption. Catsby hoped that following the blast, key Catholic nobles would rise up and take control of the government. He also planned to kidnap the king's daughter and third in line for the throne, Princess Elizabeth, and insert her on the throne as a proxy queen. The five plotters were all agreed and swore an oath of secrecy on a prayer book. By a stroke of luck, and as plans developed, Thomas Percy was appointed by his patron, the Earl of Northumberland, to a prestigious troop of royal bodyguards. This gave him cause to secure a base in London, and he managed to secure a house only a stone's throw away from Parliament. He was then joined by Fox, who posed as his servant and adopted the pseudonym John Johnson. Fortunately for Catsby, he also had a house on the other side of the river, and he began using this to stockpile gunpowder. Thomas Percy then managed to secure a storage vault under the House of Lords, and the plotters began to smuggle in the 36 barrels of gunpowder necessary to level Parliament. Due to the state opening of Parliament being delayed a number of times, a new date of November the 5th was set. Around 13 Englishmen were now involved in the plot to kill the King. They all sat back and awaited the state opening. Nothing could go wrong. Or so they thought. Guy Fawkes had been chosen as a man to ignite the gunpowder, the reason for this was that he was largely unknown to the authorities and was an explosives expert. Unbeknown to him and his co-conspirators, however, an anonymous letter sent to the Catholic Lord Monteagle urging him not to attend the state opening of Parliament had been intercepted by the King's Chief Minister, Robert Cecil. A search of Parliament's undercroft had been ordered and Fawkes was discovered with the gunpowder, matches and kindling. He was subsequently arrested and following being tortured, gave up the names of his fellow conspirators. The game was up, but for Catsby, Wright and Percy, they were determined to make one last stand in the Midlands. During a gun battle, they were subsequently shot and killed. Their fate had been far less gruesome than that of the remaining plotters, who were all rounded up and tried as traitors. Their punishment was to be hanged, drawn and quartered. Fox was condemned to the same fate, however, the story goes that he managed to jump from the scaffold and break his neck. It's quite incredible how close our plotters got to actually pulling off their plan. Had Lord Monteagle's letter not been intercepted and acted upon, then Lord knows what England might have looked like today. The United Kingdom certainly may not have existed, and the official state religion may well have been Catholicism. Who knows?